Welcome, welcome. It is day two at Seesaw Connect. We are so thrilled you are here. Please hop into the chat. Let us know where you're coming from, what you teach, uh, introduce yourself. It's always fun to see who is here live. We like to interact with you in this session. Yesterday was such a blast on day one. It's always thrilling to see who's joining us, where you're located. So I, I'm thrilled to be in this session with you today. I'm Angela from the Seesaw team, and welcome to the Ignite Talks. These innovative educators share quick and powerful strategies you can implement immediately. During this session, we encourage you to take notes. There are going to be a lot of ideas shared. And remember, you can earn points on the leaderboard for being active during the sessions, chatting, asking questions. If you liked, like closed captioning, please select CC at the top right corner of your screen. Choose your preferred language and stick around at the end because you will get your certificate and also a chance for a Seesaw gear giveaway. So we are going to go ahead and get presented, get started with our first teacher. Look at all these people hopping in today. I love to see it. We've got Ed and Elizabeth, Maria, Samantha. Thank you so much for being here today. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to my Seesaw Connect Ignite Talk. My name is Lindsay Davis, and I'm a first grade teacher from Winterport, Maine. I'm excited to share with you three ways that poetry can help us connect to our students and their families in the classroom. One of the first reasons why adding poetry into your classroom is great is that it creates an engaging learning environment. When poems are read as a whole group, students of all backgrounds and academic abilities can access the literacy benefits. Poems use vivid language, imagery, and rhythm that excites young learners. The second reason is you can use technology like Seesaw's Drawing Canvas to engage students with a poem for the first time. In my classroom, we echo read as I project the poem on our screen, and students can find enjoyment with me by finding rhyming words, rebuilding the poem, or voice recording with the Seesaw microphone. When rebuilding the poem, I type the words into a seesaw activity with each line in its own text box. It's kind of like sentence strips. Then students can manipulate those sentence strips and rebuild the poem. We can make the classroom and home better connected by sharing the poetry reading with our seesaw connected family members and friends. We can choral read any poem and voice record as a group on my teacher device, tagging all students in the post. Students can also record individually to practice fluency and share their recording. Collecting poems in a poetry notebook is a great way to help students reflect on their favorite poems and reread. I send this poetry notebook home at the end of the school year so families can continue to collect poems on their own. I type out each poem with pictures for special words and the students are able to read it three times, once as a group, once with a partner and once independently. They can cut off the excess paper and glue it into their notebook. Students can also build fluency with multiple reads and by recording themselves on Seesaw. Silly poems are a great way to excite reluctant and struggling readers. Family members then get to hear their child through a voice recording or video and can build on that work at home. Students love to see the like button tapped or a comment from their family member about their great reading work. Reading poetry also helps students develop phonemic awareness skills because of elements like rhythm and rhyme. Sometimes I even include poems that are written to the tune of well-known songs or nursery rhymes. When students share this work with their families through Seesaw, they're giving their family members a portal into the classroom. We know from an independent study that students who had more family visits that to their work had higher reading and math scores compared to students that don't. And not only have I used these strategies in my own classroom, but I was inspired by my former teachers. My kindergarten teacher especially made poetry and song the basis of our learning. I can remember reading those songs and poems from a pocket chart. My teachers connected this work to my home life by inviting parents to volunteer. Thankfully, my mom volunteered and I remember feeling so proud that she could join me and see me learn. The key here is giving students time to practice their reading. Echo reading, choral reading, partner reading, and recording their poetry will enhance language skills and literacy development. 
you can use Seesaw to promote the connection between reading, fluency, and poetry. Have students take a photo of the poem in their notebook and voice record with the microphone. Make sure your families are connected to your Seesaw class so they receive notifications on their devices when their child has added work to the class journal. Parents can hit the like button and leave comments, which is so motivating. They can continue reading and sharing this experience with their family. Engage, connect, and learn with poetry. Involve your students' family members in the learning journeys happening in your classroom. Now it's your turn to try this with your students. The best tip I can give is remember to start small. Pick one piece of this strategy to start with, then add pieces as you learn and grow. Here are your next steps. Choose a poem your students will engage with, type the poem in sentence strips in the Seesaw drawing canvas, send it to your class and teach the poem with echo and choral reading. Have the students share their work with their family members. Thank you so much for joining me for this Ignite Talk. I hope to catch up with you, learn from you, and connect. You can find me on X, in the Seesaw Community Library, or by email. Please continue to explore this topic. You can find a variety of poems for children in your local or school library or through a Google search. Set a goal for how many families you'd like to connect to your class. Use the ideas in this talk to make an impact with poetry. Build the community in your classroom and think about how your students can excel with their reading and families can engage with their child's learning. Make your poetry work routine. Students and families will look forward to this experience, continuing to foster a love for reading at school and at home. You've got this. Remember, poetry is reading power. And when families are adding to that power, students will flourish as learners. Hello, guten Tag. Vanakam, my name is Loretta Fernando Smith, and today I want to talk to you about translanguaging and about how integrating multiple languages in our classroom benefits not just our English learners, but everyone. So a little bit about myself. I've been an educator for over two decades, mainly in international schools, and I've had the joy of working with families and children from several different cultures and nations speaking several different languages. And when I first started, I would often say things like, Oh, in school, we only speak English. And that statement was really based on the belief that um, English was best learned when children were immersed in the language and only English. And that in order for children to be a part of the community and part of the discussions and part of the learning, and in order for them to access the curriculum, they needed English. Um, and this is four-year-old me in Sri Lanka with my grandfather. I grew up moving several times as a child, and I grew up speaking several different languages, and I continue to live, think, speak, and learn in multiple languages. So as you can probably tell, there's a big misdivide, a big tension between who I am and how I grew up, and my early belief and practices as a teacher. So what is translanguaging? Translanguaging is both a practice and a belief. And translanguaging recognizes that there are linguistic and academic transfers between languages. Through research, we now know that languages aren't learned in isolation, but that we use our understanding of one language to scaffold and learn a second language. We also know that learning in both your home language and a new language enhances our understanding of concepts in both the languages. So we develop a better understanding and a deeper understanding of concepts and vocabulary in both languages. And in the classroom, translanguaging looks like allowing the use of multiple languages. And doing so encourages open-mindedness, equity, and a positive sense of self and identity. Why translanguage? I just gave you several reasons about the benefits of translanguaging. Here they are summarized. So what does translanguaging look like in our classroom and how can we use Seesaw to help this translanguage? I want to share with you a few of the practices I currently do. So children translanguage naturally. They switch between languages particularly in their play. And now instead of saying, oh, in school we only speak English, I allow it. And often I will video record or voice record them and post that recording on Seesaw. And I'll caption with, um, could you please translate this for me? And often older siblings, moms, dads, aunts, uncles will leave a voice recording with a translation or type up a message. 
And this gives me a glimpse of who the child is and their personality and what they like. Um, and it also loves me to scaffold their English learning the next time they're engaged in a similar play. It loves me to provide some English words for them. I also like to model translanguaging, so I'll often refer to my mom as Amma. And being curious is another important aspect of translanguaging. So when we're counting, I might say something along the lines of, how do you count at home? Or with this picture, I would caption it with, we found a ladybird in the forest today. How do you say ladybird or ladybug in your home? Seesaw makes it easy to involve families. It naturally translates your messages and posts into 100 different languages, depending on the family's setting on their device. Literature is another great way to involve families. Here are some books that naturally already translanguage. One year, we read The Very Hungry Caterpillar at the very bottom, and I posted on Seesaw that we had done this and asked families to post how they would say caterpillar in their home language. And one little boy said, oh, I have that book at home in Turkish. And so we invited grandma to come in and read the book in Turkish. And then we had a parent read in Dutch and German and Italian. And my mother retold the story in Tamil and posted a video of herself on Seesaw. There are so many different ways to translanguage. I have just given you a few. And if you work with older children, there are also other ways that you can use Seesaw and different apps to help children um, access the curriculum in their home language, build English skills quickly, and be a part of the classroom right from the start. I encourage you to be curious. I encourage you to be brave because it can feel scary loving several languages into your classroom that you don't speak. And I encourage you to connect with each other because we can learn a lot from others and connect with your students and connect with your families. On that note, feel free to reach out and connect with me. I would love to hear some of the things that you are doing in your classroom already. Thank you. Tschüss, auf Wiedersehen, goodbye, Pointe Waren. Hi, this is about voice and choice, why digital portfolios are essential to all. I am, um, so let's talk about what did you learn in school today? Hmm, here's some examples. You don't remember anything? You were there all day. Um, I had recess. What did you learn in school today? Nothing. I get that one a lot. So who am I? I am Brittany Jones. I'm an instructional technology leader in Waller ISD. I'm located northwest of Houston, Texas. I'm a former early childhood educator. I taught grades pre-K through fifth, and this is my 12th year in education now I'm serving in technology curriculum. My inspiration are my twin boys, Asher and Parker, who just completed pre-K, and every single day I would ask them, okay, what did you learn today? What did you do? What did you read? And they would tell me, absolutely nothing. They remember the PE, but they did not remember anything that's happened in the classroom. Personally, I know their teacher and I know she's absolutely amazing. And she would read books and do all kinds of activities. And my kids, they were learning and they were absorbing and they were having a wonderful time. But as a parent, I had no idea what they were doing and how to support them. So that's why I developed Project Portfolio. There are two main objectives. One, data for teacher. You're able to track student growth with qualitative data that can be stored and shared securely with stakeholders. Stakeholders meaning parents, meaning other teachers, or partner teachers, meaning structural facilitators, meaning um, they have a support staff, your principals, curriculum coordinators, anybody who is a stakeholder with that child, can it can be shared with. And it's also a great way to celebrate every win. It's not just for early childhood, but also for high school students taking courses that are not uh, justified through a test. Teacher buy-in. What does success look like to you in your classroom? What does success look like for this one student? It's going to vary. And that's why the project portfolio is so amazing because what is great for one student is not great for the other student. And so this allows you to have that one-on-one -on -one with that student and they have their own quality of data and they can share it from the beginning and they're only being judged by themselves. Consistency. The only way this project works is you have to try growth over time, whether that's once a week, once a month, or every nine weeks, entries must be taken to see the growth. So you have to figure out what's best for you in your classroom. 
In early childhood, this might look a little different. I would say use Seesaw. Students can have word samples in each subject, reading, writing, math, gross motor, or fine motor, including music and art, which is awesome because we oftentimes don't get to see what they're learning and what they're working on in those classes. In elementary, using Seesaw, another platform, we have Canvas for our upper elementary. Students can have the opportunity to select their best highlights to document their work. So if they have more digital work options, they can have a lot to choose from and only choose their best items they want to showcase. For secondary, you can challenge students to be highly selective of their portfolio, allowing it to represent who they are in all aspects of their development, including volunteering, clubs, organizations, and of course, their content. And this can also be a great way to also tie that into their college readiness. Who benefits from this? You have the parents. They will be more invested. They know what's going on in the classroom all the time. They're more willing to learn and they're more willing to also help guide their students at home and do the same practices that you're doing at home. And also administrators, they will be able to see what's going on. It will be joy to the face. They're going to be so excited all the hard work that you're doing in the classroom. The amount of students that benefit from this is endless. You have pre-K, cosmetology, speech, art, theater, Anyone can be a part of the project portfolio and anyone can do it. And it's a great way to have show the kid we're not just one subject, but we're a whole school and we want to educate the whole of you. So to get started, find out who to talk to. Coordinators, teachers, principals, you know. And of course, get the students input. What do they want to share? What do they want to highlight? That's an example of a teacher showing a parent exactly what they want the kid to do. They're showing them how they practice, and the kid can see this next month. Oh, I know all my letters. Um, also, this is an example of one of our college students. She is demonstrating it was a beauty day. And so that's a great way of volunteering, service, and also cosmetology. And here we have an example from Cooking Club. The student created their book, they created the recipe, and then they had their product. And that's ice cream, like ice cream sundae, which can't come home. So this is the only opportunity that parents will be able to see it. Why? Parents, students, teachers, everyone benefits from this project. So stay in touch with me. I'm B Jones at WallerISC.net. And most importantly, have fun with this. Hi, I'm Luana Gracia, and I'm an instructional data system support teacher in Northside ISD here in San Antonio, Texas. Today, I'm going to introduce three ways to help promote student agency in your early childhood class. We can definitely empower our students to become more independent. You know, Maria Montessori thought so too. She said, I have studied this question for a long time and I am continually surprised. I understand more and more how advanced and able small children can be. You need to start with the basics. Include these basics along with your classroom management at the beginning of the year. Routines should include knowing how to handle care and store devices. This includes uh, charging as well. Structured in a consistent schedule enables your students to trust you and the process going forward. It's also very important to teach your student, students what your expectations for quality work are. Students can strive to meet those each and every day. Next is preparation. The process of consuming versus creation is important to consider. Matt Miller, who researched this, suggests that our students need both. Sometimes our students are consuming a lot of information and they don't get the chance to apply what they've learned in a creative way. In other words, I think we need to have a balance and that's what Matt Miller suggested too. You can achieve this by knowing your learning targets. It's all about prioritizing and knowing the why behind your instruction. Once that happens, everything falls into place with a little hard work, right? Okay, and autonomy. I'm going to show you some examples of how students can eventually work more independently. Playlists are one of those. There's a variety of ways to create them. This one in particular is where the teacher created two rows of tasks. The top are tasks that the students needed to complete within a week's time. First, they needed to do those first, and that's a must do. Now, after they completed those tasks throughout the week, they could do the second row 
Those are may do's. And I like the visuals of the mustard and the mayonnaise. So uh, this is an example of a playlist of a first grade class here in our district. Next are recorded directions. Students can replay audio or video directions. Review is when they zoom in on the video or the direction that teaches a skill or repeats an instruction. And rewind is similar to asking for a question to be repeated. This allows students the opportunity to control how fast or slow their learning is. This method of instruction is researched by Catlin Tucker. I'm sure you've heard of blended learning. If not, this is her book if you want to dive in deeper. I recently observed a teacher testing her kiddos in small group in a kindergarten class at the end of the year. Students were busy using playlists and completing their work for the day as their teacher was testing at her kidney table. I was amazed at how engaged and on task each of the students were. They knew the routines, knew how to put things away. Most importantly, they knew an appropriate way to collaborate with one another. And I was just amazed. So I did talk with the teacher and she said she implemented the three points that I suggested as well as others throughout the school year. You know, because with our littles, we always have to revisit expectations. So let's review. Remember, basics. Structure offers comfort. If your students feel safe, they'll trust the process. Know your learning targets helps you prepare and get a better understanding of what your students need and how you can set up their learning. When students feel empowered to have choice, they gain confidence, ultimately enabling them to become more independent. Stacy Rashan says that when we give our learners the right platforms to express their ideas and integrate tools that make them respond in a way that is comfortable to them, we allow each student's most powerful voice to shine. What a powerful quote. You can find this in her book, Tech with Heart. I mentioned blended learning. And here's Mitch, Matt Miller's book, Ditch That Textbook, if you want to dive deeper into this topic. Thank you for joining me today. You can find me on Twitter at Kinder Gracia or through Facebook Seesaw Educator Group. Enjoy your Connect experience. Welcome. Word work is important for practice, but we hope to make it fun for the kids and simple for ourselves. The activities I'm going to share are easy to set up and teach, yet effective in helping students commit words to their long-term memory. And Seesaw is the best tool to help document student learning. Hi, my name is Nicole Cucci. I'm a basic skills reading teacher from Heightstown, New Jersey. In my 20 plus years of teaching, I've taught first, second, third, and fifth grades. I currently teach kindergarten, first, and second grade struggling readers. Research suggests that we scan every letter of every word that we read. Readers notice a sequence of letters, are able to say the sounds connected to those letters, and after some practice, commit that word to memory. This is known as orthographic mapping. Providing students with hands-on word mapping activities help them commit these words to their long-term memory faster. So what about sight words? These are also known as heart words. These words have parts that are irregular and don't match the sounds learned. Said is a great example. The S and D make the right sounds, but the AI makes the sound E, eh, not A. So we need to teach students which parts are tricky and need to be learned by heart. For this word mapping activity, students tap the sounds in the words to isolate them. They write the letter or letters for each sound. They place magnetic bingo chips to show each sound and zap it to blend the sounds together to say the word. Finally, they write the word. Research shows after about five times, most students can commit the word to their long-term memory. Another word mapping activity uses these boxes to help students tap the sounds make a dot for each sound, and write the letter or letters that match. Finally, use a toy card to zoom across and blend the sounds together to say the word. When mapping sounds, it is one sound per box. The digraphs TH, WH, SH, CH, and CK get one box because the two letters make one sound. For vowel consonant E words, the E can be written in the bottom right corner and crossed out to show that it doesn't make a sound. 
This activity is the same as the others, but it has the addition of hearts above the boxes. After writing the letters for the word, students will color just the heart that is above the letters or letters that don't make the sounds it traditionally makes. These activities can be easily implemented into your small group and center work. To make the center activity reusable, simply put a paper into a dry erase pocket. Students can make videos of their work on Seesaw, talking through the steps. These can then be used to assess students and share with families. I know when I'm learning something new, when there's a physical component, it helps me to learn faster and hold on to the information. These activities will do the same for your students when learning new words. Seesaw can be used to preset the words students will practice. I created this activity and recorded a different word on each page. Students complete the activity the same way that they would on the dry erase pocket. Seesaw adds a level of fun because they can choose different tools when doing their work. It's also great to share this in their journals with their families. Here is the heart word activity. Again, coloring the box above the part that is the tricky part. In addition, you could have this activity without the words recorded and students could choose their own words to practice. These activities are easily updated with word lists that your students are currently working on. You could change the Seesaw activity to just one slide without any words recorded. Students would then record their own words for word mapping. They could make as many pages as needed. There are many manipulatives that can be used to help students map words. Poppets provide a tactile tool that students can use to tap out the sounds. You could also use green, yellow, and red chips to help students visually see the beginning, middle, and end sounds in words. The ideas are endless. I hope you found this session helpful. I encourage you to reach out to your colleagues because as teachers, we often have manipulatives that can be easily shared to keep these activities ever changing. Thank you for watching. Hi everyone and mabuhay. Welcome to my Ignite Talk entitled Sparking Curiosity, Active Learning Adventures for Young Minds. My name is Kia. I am a Filipino primary two teacher and level coordinator from Siskalapagading, Northeast Jakarta in Indonesia. Let's begin. So what exactly is active learning? When we say active learning, it's when students engage in meaningful and purposeful activities. They take responsibility for their own learning and in active learning, teachers do not spoon feed the information, but act as guides. Studies have also shown that active learning develops higher order thinking skills and promotes a deeper understanding and retention of lesson materials. But why do we really need to do active learning? In my years of experience, I have come up with five reasons or benefits as to why active learning works. First, active learning grabs students' attention and increases motivation. Excited and happy students are the ones who are usually willing to learn. Next, Active learning is a great and fun form of assessment, a way that your students won't even realize they're being tested or assessed because they're having so much fun. Third, active learning improves problem solving skills, even for students at a young age. Fourth, active learning explores relevance of lessons in everyday life. They'll be able to know how their lessons are applied in real life situations. And my personal favorite, active learning develops social and emotional skills. May it be compromising in a group work or pair work or improving the, their self-confidence and self-esteem when it comes to completing an activity or work. I'd like to share some active learning strategies that have worked in my class so you can try them out too. First is interactive activities. These are group work, hands-on experiments, and games. Let them use materials to make a marble run on the wall, pretend to be paleontologists, and even let them teach 
an action poem that they've made by themselves to their classmates. Next is questioning techniques. This is when we encourage our students to ask and answer questions and to let them use open-ended questions to stimulate thought. You can let them do surveys, questionnaires for other people and teach them how to do mini debates for topics and issues that are relevant and close to their hearts. Next are real, real world connections. This is when we relate lessons to real life situations and experiences. My students wanted to know why their cars move slower on bumpy roads compared to smooth expressways and highways. They were able to use different materials and investigate friction, speed, and the different materials used to make roads. And lastly, technology integration. This is when we use apps like Seesaw in order to enhance our students' learning experience. My students enjoyed doing research this year. So with the help of Seesaw, they were able to do a lot of them in a fun and memorable way. Lastly, when our students learn, we teachers learn from them too. Doing active learning activities and strategies in the classroom will not always be a smooth sailing lesson, but in order to improve, we can do some student reflection, teacher reflections, and collect valuable feedback from your students, from your colleagues, supervisor, and your parents. I hope I have sparked your curiosity today Please start and try creating active learning adventures for your tiny humans and their brilliant minds. Thank you so much for joining me today. Don't forget to connect via the socials below and you may email me if you have any questions. Have a great day. Bye. Hi, and welcome to five ways to use Seesaw in a virtual environment. I am so thrilled that you're here. I'm Ann Lawyer and I'm a structured literacy dyslexia specialist and a longtime Seesaw ambassador. So teachers often think online tools are more work and less effective. But let me show you why that's not the case with five key reasons. Students have really diverse abilities. So using AI generation helps engage all our students, including those that are needing help with oral language practice and those quieter students. So look at this. My students created these pictures with Copilot. This enhanced their excitement, improved their oral language, their visual language, and their writing skills. So this tool really creates creativity and collaboration. Students are able to create assignments for each other, so this boosts engagement and participation. You know, I even had a student get up before the bus to write a story on another student's picture. And as you can see from the slide, I have some students that are typing, I have some students that are recording, so I was able to differentiate and really meet students at their level. So another way that we use Seesaw is with writing organization. It makes it fun and ensures there's no more lost papers. So here's an example of a graphic organizer with a student. So the student created it and this significantly improved his writing output. Another way is we always want students to show what they know. So here we have where I use Seesaw for their spelling notebooks. We don't always have to use technology. Here we use paper, pencil, but that this enabled the students and the parents to see their progress. We can also adapt traditional worksheets. Here we were teaching text features. It made it very engaging. They worked on typing and different activities with this. Also look at this one. Uh, we use color coding for those close reading skills. We use the annotation tools and this allowed the students to record their learning and ultimately encourage that reading comprehension. So with those spelling notebooks I showed you earlier, we can create word sorts that practice those phonics skills. And to differentiate, I can create them, 
Uh, the students can create them. They can use them for sentences or stories or showing other students. There's so many different ways that they can use this. The last example that I wanted to show you is it adds, aids in data collection and progress monitoring. So it makes it easy to share proof and progression with families. So here's an example of an actual activity um, for an IEP goal and progress monitoring that supported uh, various learning needs. So here we have that short A on the top. I recreated that as a DGE and GE. We can do the recording. We can look at how they spell, how they're sounding. There's a lot of different ways that we can use a data point for this. Also, ensuring that students can write the alphabet helps gauge their writing fluency and their overall reading skills. So as you can see up here at the top of the slide was one of their initial uh, alphabets and then their progress on the bottom. We can also use this for fluency. We, use re we can use this for repeated readings, benchmarks. Seesaw makes this all very simplified. Did you know that Seesaw also supports advanced skills way beyond K2? with ideas like vocabulary, morphology, chapter summaries, using those heart words, making learning engaging and effective for all of our students. So this was one, uh, one day of assignments where I had students working on all different things, all to meet their goals. So I hope this quick presentation has sparked ideas for using Seesaw in your classroom. I'm always looking for new and unique ways to use Seesaw. And I'm always excited to explore all of Seesaw's capabilities. So thank you for joining me today. And if you'd like to reach out to me, please write to me at Hand in Hand Reading on Facebook or Instagram, and I will be dropping in some resources for you. Have a great day. Okay, lots of ideas. I really hope you were taking notes ferociously. So many uh, ideas shared back to back. Love a good ignite. Uh, again, your certificate will be emailed to you and all session recordings that we are making while we're live here today will start to be available on demand August 4th. And if you have time, visit the networking tab to chat with other educators from around the world and earn points on the leaderboard. The top 50 people today are winning prizes at the end of the day. So make sure to participate and connect. That's what it's all about. And for the fun part right now, we are going to do a couple of giveaways. So I'm going to get our spinner going. Let's do this. Here we go. See who our winners are in this session today. All right, if you see your name pop up, congratulations, Ramisha and Naomi. This is fantastic. You don't need to do anything. We will reach out to you and contact you. And everyone, thank you for being here today and see you in the next session.